So hello everyone to another Military History Verbalized podcast and to give you a special guest, Tech Era, who is uh, quite experienced on the Cold War. And as a pastime, he requests usually declassified documents of military intelligence about the Soviet Union. And hello, Tech Era, can you please introduce yourself? Hi there, I'm Tech Era. I have a bachelor's in history from a Canadian university and I have a studied uh, former Soviet armed forces for a number of years now as a pastime. I have the privilege of speaking to a number of individuals who have participated in this effort, accessing a few of the documents in which the Russian Military Studies Archive at Cranfield University has. Excellent. And today we will talk about Soviet war plans. So basically, for those people who are not very well served with the Cold War and the Soviet Union, um, can you can you give a brief introduction about the basic assumptions or the the basic differences we have nowadays in the world and that were behind those war plans or in general the situation? All right, I'll give a brief background on the military situation as it pertains to the 1980s, very briefly in Central Europe. Basically. Um, in divided Germany, East and West Germany, we have two armed camps of um, two opposing alliances. Uh, of course, on the West, we have the Northern Treaty Alliance, NATO, with their forces. And to the East, we have the forces of the Warsaw Pact and the communist countries, with their forces concentrated in East Germany, Poland, and Czechoslovakia. And as it stood in the mid late 1980s, uh, one could argue that the concentration of soldiers, armored vehicles, tactical aircraft, and artillery in Central Europe was perhaps one of the densest in past half decade in terms of um, peacetime concentration. Entire Cold War, there has there have been assumptions on. And um, predictions on how exactly this, how exactly these two alliances would fight if the Cold War had gone hot, either with nuclear weapons, with conventional weapons. And fortunately for the rest of the world and for the entire world, the Cold War ended in the collapse of communism and the USSR instead of um, with guns blazing and nuclear explosions. So. If you look at a war plan, what, what, what is this basically? Because I, I could say a, a war plan, okay, this could be anything from, from a grand strategic idea, but basically down to, to army level, what it would attack. All so... right. We'll concentrate at a very high level for this podcast. Um, I'll take a definition of war planning from a book of World War I war planning by Richard F. Hamilton and Holger W. Herwin. Okay, um, I think it's important to caution against uh, the, um, the stereotype of the war plan as the plan that that's that has been put on so much so many hours into it that just needs to be implemented. But uh, I think of uh, you could um, put a, a war plan as uh, a, a process that's more of a continuous, ever-changing planning effort because. Um, all armies' plans, they have lots of contingency plans, for example. And um, so instead of suggesting like an orderly planning process directed by rash, rational calculations, um, it's best to think about it as like a continuous process that's, um, that's um, continually updated as, uh, as contingencies um, change and uh, and uh, international situation changes as well. For example, um, as the Cold War was ending, um, in, in the U.S. Army Seven Corps, as uh, as their uh, contingency plans for the defense of Western Europe were no longer politically viable, um, they were actually um, making up contingency plans for expeditionary operations in places like Liberia. So, so war planning is a continuous. So it's it's not something set in stone. Some people believe so. Okay, we go there. So basically, yeah. it, it always yeah, we, always adapts to the situation. And and yeah, it's it's mu 
it reminds me a bit. I think is, I think it's an Eisenhower quote that he says, uh, "No plan will survive the contact with the enemy, but planning in, is indispensable." Yeah, and I think uh, Helmut von Moltke also said also was credit a credit to said that back in nineteen years. Well. So and and these war plans on 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 what level were they drafted? I mean, what was this basically? Did this come out of the Politburo or the okay the the Soviet Army headquarters? Uh, I I'm I'm not really aware of the structure of the Soviet Union at this part. Or are we talking about okay. more local war plans? So basically, um, the rough hierarchy is that you had the Politburo sending directives to the general staff of the Soviet Armed Forces. And during the 1980s, um, the hierarchy was that a general staff would be having a rough control over the theater commands, which are called the theaters of strategic military action. There's one for um, the West, Southwest, uh, the South, and the Far East. And these feeder commands would control the army groups, and the army groups themselves would control the armies, and from there, the armies control the divisions, uh, the the regiments, and the uh, other lower subunits at a tactical level. So, what ends up happening at a high level is that the armed forces, through the general staff, prepare the contingency plan for a large number of war scenarios. And then the general staff advises the defense council in the Communist Party on the military act alternatives open to them in case of war breaking out or if they want to wage a war. So, so in the Soviet context, um, planning is a vehicle for putting their uh, norms and calculations into practice uh, because um during the cold war um the soviets became very obsessive obsessive with the use of free time in uh in modern battle because um they believed that successive um generations of of military development since 1945 had sharply decreased the amount of time needed for planning out operations and tactical missions from from the general's perspective all the way down to uh, lieutenants or captains or lieutenant colonel at the battalion level. So, so planning for them is a vehicle for them to use their battlefield, battlefield calculations and, and historical data that they've um, generated through uh, statistical research on past wars. I'm not sure if I got it, Mitt. The amount of free time was... Uh, was yes, limited. okay. Basically, um, the Soviets calculated um, through their, during the post-war period, the Soviets um, were very obsessive with um, calculating on the amount of time needed to perform an action. So, for example, um, the amount of time, for example, they have like uh, estimates for the amount of time needed to, for example, suppress a NATO tank platoon with artillery within 15 minutes. So um, they would calculate how many rounds they needed to need within a 15 minute time span to, to suppress a NATO tank platoon. So that might be, for example, um, 3,152 millimeter shells that they need to fire in 15 minutes, for example. And these types of estimates, uh, they, um, the Soviets call these estimates norms. And they use these norms to to sharply reduce the amount of time that they need themselves to plan out uh, how the tactical missions would look. So they basically they, go like they have like okay, they see they have a tank platoon, an enemy tank platoon there, and then they know okay, they look basically in the book or then they know it. Okay, we need so much shots in so much amount of time to suppress that unit, and then we move in another unit to destroy the tank platoon. More align, more like yes, an, uh, a resi- uh, like a recipe basis that okay i need to put that in and that and then i get i get that product it's more of what you said in in the former because um um when they when they plan out this stuff uh time is the ultimate is the pretty much the most important one of the most important uh 
factors in planning. So they use a lot of what they call norms and prepared battlefield calculations during this plan planning process. And they use and they use this uh, uh, system of norms and battlefield calculations um, throughout all levels of uh, of their planning from the from the strategic level down to the tactical level, though at a tactical level it gets very austere because they use more uh, battle drills at the tactical level. So battle drill basically means in that way... Battle drills are a type of uh, uh, pre-arranged uh, solution to a battlefield problem that, they, that uh, battlefield commanders take off the peg and they modify to local conditions. It, it's a very different uh, process from Western perspectives. Uh, yeah. Or um... I, I think I, I think it, this reminds me of something. When I was in in Slovenia in the museum, they they showed me how to reload. Uh, I think a one hundred millimeter gun, and they noted exactly how long every how long it should take, because they were, everyone was thrilled that they have to be able to reload this. I think in three or four seconds. So basically, yeah. they have every yeah, so they have we... every action assigned down to the to the very basic handgriffe. <laughs> What's the English word? Um, the basic motions, so that that the the, the whole it's a whole mega system composed of subsystems. On this way, that yeah. you can cal calculate everything. In principle, at a very low level, a Soviet soldier was intended to be kind of like a semi-automated robot in a few ways. Yeah, I was um, thinking Soviet of soldiers. Well. <laughs> um, the normal Soviet soldier is usually trained in two major skills and maybe maybe one other skill. And, you're, and the basic principle is that the, the Soviet soldier, a Soviet conscript, is trained very thoroughly into, into um, performing basic tasks. And I'm not very, I'm not very knowledgeable on the armies of the former Yugoslav Republic, but uh, they might have um, inherited some of that, that notion of, uh, that Pavlonian notion of uh, basic soldier conditioning from the Soviet. I'm not very knowledgeable about that. We'll have, I need to get an expert on the former Yugoslav army for that. So then how, how could a, such a, a plan look like? Okay, a structured plan, uh, like uh, I'll give you a, a sample from the 1970s, this was used in uh, the Soviet General Staff Academy, and it was provided to the West by the Afghan Army Defector Gulam Wardak, who was like a colonel in the Afghan Army before the communist coup in 1978. And um, Mr. Wardak defected to the United States in the 1980s after he was injured in battle with injured in battle fighting as part of the Mujahideen. And um, after he moved to the United States, one of the documents that he provided to the West was a sample of pl planning at the general staff perspective. So basically, I can give you one from the Soviet army group level. So here is the stage of planning decision making. The first stage for the commander is to calculate the front the depth and width of the army group mission, time needed to achieve these, and the required rate of advance to achieve the to achieve the objectives within the allotted time frame. So from these calculations, he derives a general idea of the number of forces he needs and how they would be arranged within his concept of operation. And then within this, within this uh, calculation, the commander and his uh, chief of staff calculates the amount of time needed to prepare and plan out the preparation for, for, how, for the planning. So that's stage one, the, the clarification of the mission and assignment of the time and the basic parameters needed. Now, um, step two is... Um, the army group commander and his staff estimating the situation, which has its uh, subcomponent. So, for the estimate of the situation, um, the army group commander will, est will get an estimate of how NATO forces would look. So, he calculates the density 
of the NATO forces in a sector in terms of divisions, what types of nuclear, what uh, the number of nuclear weapons that NATO might have, and the number, and the nuclear weapons are are estimates. So he so the command determines how he might want to destroy them. Um, the enemy, the enemy's artillery capabilities, um, capabilities of their tactical aircraft, and time and space factors for the NATO forces. So, so which means um, the commander estimates the NATO forces, which are capable of immediate action within the allocated time frame, and NATO forces that might be committed to battle at a later date. For example, uh, reinforcements from from the Netherlands or from the United States um, being shipped up to be committed to battle, for example. And from there, he takes into consideration what types of disturbances or time schedule time schedule that might be introduced, for example, by 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 NATO action. So that's a basic uh, overview of how they would estimate the enemy forces and the second part of the situation estimate is that he estimates his own forces and his friendly forces using the same calculations so it's mostly in terms of uh the time needed to mobilize and bring his forces to full battle readiness and a time needed to organize his forces his own forces into uh into attack grouping, so, so for so for the, the Soviet army group commander, estimating his own forces, they're mostly a reconfirmation of his own pre-existing plans and estimates for his own side, and and um, re-updating them if the situation has changed. My question here: um, Does this include mobilization, or is the war plan already assuming that? mobilization has been performed already because uh, i know this, this the, uh, okay. the red army the has to be mobilized basically or yes, more yes. mobilized because it wasn't based on reserves within this uh, 1970s estimate it's assumed that it takes into account movement from the garrison so that would also include movement by rail to the to the assembly area before being before marching into the area of operations. So basically, basic mobilization is is completed, and then we are ready for war, and and then we move from the garrison to the front line. Okay, yeah, yeah. So um, I would like to emphasize these two estimates: estimates of the enemy and the estimates of of themselves, because the Soviet Soviet plans. Have um, have two important uh, outcomes that they want to get from this, from these two estimates. The first is is called a correlation of forces and mean, which is the density of force. Not a density; it's the ratio of force from force, and this is particularly important because um, if you're um, the Soviet principle is that they want to concentrate. Their um their most powerful forces into strike grouping, and then um they want to commit these strike groupings into where the enemy is um is um weak. For example, um during 1980s, um Western uh, analysts um covering the Soviet Union um assumed that that the Soviets would have attacked against uh placed their main attack against the uh, forces of the of the the Netherlands and the Belgian because um, they believed that the Soviets estimated that the Belgians and the du Dutch were the weakest uh, the weakest army corps on the on the NATO front line and um, this is important because um, um, if you I'm not sure if you, if um, you read it in your past readings but um, during the late late phases of the the Eastern Front in World War II, um, the Soviets would, um, Red Army would increasingly favor encirclements and cleaving blows against the weakest parts of the of the German uh, defensive line. 
So basically, it's similar to Schwerpunkt from the Germans. So attack with, with a concentration of force at the weakest point of the enemy to to break through and then create uh, an encirclement. Well, yes, it's the same principle. Um, there are a couple of nuances um, beyond that. Um, for example, um, the Soviets would um, the Soviets would make sure that they would commit forces on on a secondary attack against uh, strong NATO groupings in order to in order to fix those groupings. Um, during the 1980s, the Western analysts um, wrote that um, wrote that the Soviets estimated that uh, that um, the strongest NATO groupings were um, were the two American Army Corps in in, uh, in Western Germany as well as the three West German Corps on the NATO front line. So they would start a diversionary attack there and then break yes. through at the Belgian and Dutch and concentrate yes, the troops uh, there. Yes, they would do that in principle. Uh, yeah, the nuance, the, the difference is that the Soviets would would dedicate significant amounts of um, secondary forces to, to, to conduct uh, secondary and fixing attacks against the stronger NATO forces. And by secondary, would this also mean secondary? Um, I mean, in in the terms of the quality, or or just uh, in in numbers, for instance. When I talk about secondary, I talk about their role within the concept of operations. So, if you, for example, if you imagine your your finger, for example, your whole hand, you can imagine your middle finger as making your the main thrust into the into the into the NATO um, sector, while the rest of your hands, the rest of your fingers, are the secondary, making the secondary attacks against the strong force groups in in the NATO front line. And the secondary, the second um, factor within the friendly enemy estimate is um, density, which is the ratio of force to space. The ratio of force and space is particularly important because um, during the uh, in the late 1970s, uh, in the Soviet military journal Military Herald, uh, a Soviet major published an article that was called "Planning for Fire Destruction of Targets Creative Creatively," and that article was important because um, there was a table that that made an estimate on how many NATO anti-tank weapons need to be destroyed or suppressed in order for an armored force to have a successful attack. So um, density is important because um, um, the Soviets believe that a NATO um, defensive position can easily amass 15 anti-tank weapons per kilometer front. So, which means from the Soviet perspective, a normal attack is uh, bound to fail unless there's a means of improving the ratio, for example, by using artillery to suppress the anti-tank missile launchers. And this comes to our, our mention of density, because the lower density you can make the anti-tank weapons, the more successful your attacks with tank units can be. And if you have, a, if you have an accurate estimate of of the uh, of NATO's uh, forces, you can from there on you can also get a get a reliable estimate of how dense their anti-tank weapons are getting. From there on, you can calculate, can make an estimate and calculate how much artillery or flanking or maneuvers you need to to penetrate through um, the the tactical zone of defense for of NATO's. And once you have these. Once you have these calculations from and a correlation of force, force and means and uh, density, from there on, the Soviet commander can make a deduction on the possible distribution of troops to the to the axes and how you are going to this to assign the combat support elements. So engineers, artillery, um, tactical air support helicopters, how you would deploy your heliborn troops in order to make the attack more successful, how you are going to, to um, 
commit to your follow on forces or exploitation echelons? And how are you going to distribute your electronic warfare assets, for example, stemming from those, from those calculations and estimates? So did they have like certain fixed ratios or more or less that it would say, okay, if we have a, yes, a yes, ratio of do. this, then well, we yeah, have, have deploy. Guidelines. Okay. Yes, they do have guidelines. Um, to add some perspective, um, NATO defense analysts during the 1980s are writing in journals like International Defense Review and International Security. Um, they use the conventional wisdom of three to one, which is uh, for an attack to be successful, um, you need like three tanks, three, three tanks to uh, for every NATO tank for a successful Soviet attack. But the Soviets fought them um, very differently. Because um, on in central Germany, um, according to to analysts like um, John Hines in his uh, papers from the 1980s, um, um, the Soviets had only a one to fifteen one to fifteen ratio in forces. That means um, that means uh, for in terms of um, ground forces, um, it was only one. Um, Point five in favor of the Soviet Union. Oh, that's very which, little. Yeah, which means even though, uh, even though if we look at a bean count of how many how many uh, NATO tanks and troops there are in comparison to to Soviet tanks and troops in terms of like combat power, there are roughly around one one to one point five in terms of uh, correlation of forces. Coalition of force to force. This disparity is actually least uh, is actually very narrow in terms of manpower, and it's actually the most pronounced in terms of artillery. So in manpower, it was almost equal, but in artillery, the Soviets have way more. Yes. Uh, let me see. Yeah. So I have a comparison between. Um, the British Army in Germany versus the first shock army of the Soviet Union in in uh, in East Germany. So in terms of manpower, it's it's the same, but uh, in terms of artillery, um, there's a, it's six times in favor of the Soviets, while their number of tanks is two point five in favor of the Soviets. Okay, six times in artillery. Yeah, yeah I, I, that sounds a bit like Eastern Front. Yeah, yeah, and, and there's a higher higher um level of self propelled artillery for the Soviets this time. And and what it really is, do you, do you still name the armies shock armies? Um, no. Um, shock armies was a term that that a Western defense analysts still continue to use. Um, the name just stuck, but the Soviets um abandoned that name um after World War Two. They just called them guard. They just called them regular combined arms army. Okay, because it was like okay, shock army. <laughs> yeah. So let's let's some turn our discussion back on um the force ratios and correlation of forces to forces. As we said before, um, the correlation of forces in the Central Front wasn't exactly overwhelming overwhelming uh overall which means you um for the if you're a soviet attacker you have to find some means of making those correlations decis decisive which means you have to have those concentrated attack sectors in which the enemy is weak which means the soviets could mass divisions on a attack sector that's only four to eight kilometers wide, which means on a penetration sector that's only four to eight kilometers wide, you turn an overall slight superiority of 1.5 into a massive superiority of 4.4 to 7 in terms of um, correlation of force to force. Okay, how is that achieved exactly? You you just pull in more divisions, or 
is this achieved um, through the selection, through the through the signing of uh, of your attacking forces into into strike sectors, which um, there are multiple means of doing this. Um, first of all, um, it's important that you use a form of deception to to make sure that the enemy strong force groupings are not concentrated against your attack sectors, so you will have to use a means of deception. Um, the other, an, a, a second means is the, and it's very important for the Soviets, is the, the achievement of surprise. Um, during the 1980s, um, there, was, there was one uh, analyst by the name of Charles J. Dick, who in 1986, he published an article in International Defense Review called Catching NATO Unawares. And um, I think it's a very important article because um, NATO kind of uh, NATO exercises kind of assumed that that they would face the Warsaw Pact with, with a well prepared defense, um, while Charles Dick argued that NATO that um, the Warsaw Pact would um, would invariably attack on with a, de- with a degree of surprise, which means. Uh, the Warsaw Pact would would attack on in a situation in which NATO forces were in the middle of deploying to their to their defense positions or slight or slightly before that. If that if um, the Soviets achieve surprise, that means um, they do not have to mass as many forces in terms of achieving uh, a decisive penetration and carrying. Carrying their tactical success into the depths of um, West Germany. Oh, so that's your second method of um, of making it possible. So the basically, method, it's a Zerg rush in StarCraft terms. Well, it would look like a Zerg rush if you were uh, if you were a NATO NATO tank or soldier at, at the sharp end. Okay, and and how? I mean, so basically, the deception and the surprise. And yes, I mean, my, my, for me, I, I, what I see the problem is first of all, okay, you, you pull off the deception and you have to pull off the surprise, but also for the concentration, and everything you need a lot of logistics and everything. So, yes, um, yes, um, basically, comparison to say NATO forces, which, um, the because in, in, in normally in NATO divisions, um, the bulk of their logistics are concentrated within the the divisions themselves, in which, in, in which, um, because um, for NATO, um, the division commanders um, have a demand pool system for logistics and rear support. In comparison, the Soviet military concentrated their logistical assets in a more centralized form at army and army group level. This means, um, and if you could. And this combined with the higher quality of um, of commanders and staffs at the army and army group level, this makes it much um, easier to do a much more centralized type of um, regrouping of divisions and re- and assigning and reassigning logistical support and um, combat support between axes as the situation developed. So basically, the the whole divisions and everything is structured differently. Yeah, I think it was the same in the Second yes. World War that that also the German divisions had all yeah. the logistical elements in them, but the so it didn't. So comparing them is always quite a problem. Yeah, broadly speaking, Soviet divisions are much leaner in terms of logistical and rear area support because um the uh, the Soviets believed that they didn't want to burden them with with uh, rear area logistical assets to burden on their mobility in battle. From the, from the Western perspective, it's kind of um, very weird because Western armies don't really do this. Yeah, you want independent units that you can, can completely fight on their own and, and do their stuff. Yeah. I mean, okay, centralization yeah. also makes sense because it's a, a core thing of, of communist thinking by the way state decentralized and moscow is in the center and everything yeah so it's it's probably um, also influenced by that and another factor to to make those um narrow penetrations possible is um 
concentration of artillery, indirect fire assets, which also includes airstrikes and, uh, and helicopter strikes as well. And this ties into what we said before about concentration of force, which is not, not really that unique for, uh, in terms of basic military. So what was the NATO perspective on this? Yeah, um, during the uh, during the nineteen eighties, uh, NATO had two principles for uh, for the defense of uh, Western Europe. The first was flexible response, in which it was adopted in the nineteen sixties, which was that instead of um, launching nuclear weapons from the onset of a Soviet attack, they would they would attempt to defeat a Soviet attack through conventional forces. And if conventional defense failed, NATO would use tactical nuclear weapons. And if that failed, they would use strategic nuclear weapons. And forward defense is um, was adopted uh, at the end of, end of the 1960s because uh, end of 1950s because then the first NATO war war um, strategy was that they would um, use fallback positions. Down and establish their main defensive position at the on the Rhine River, which is not very appealing to, to the West Germans because <laughs> most of the country is occupied before before you can uh, do your your main defense. Most uh, but, all of, of of Germany is occupied yeah, yeah. if you defend at the Rhine. <laughs> yeah. So after after um, West Germany w- was. Uh, after the Bundeswehr was uh, established, and, yeah. and then um, after, and then you, the, Ger- the German chiefs of staff um, pushed for forward defense, which was the, ma- the basic uh, principle for NATO up to the end of the Cold War, which is um, you defend West Germany uh, uh, up to the border, up to the border of East Germany, and um, and all all forms of um, counter attacks and counter-offensives are about pushing the Soviets out and restoring the forward edge of the battlefield. And um, of course, this really doesn't have uh, much of a... It was very weak in principle, of course. Um, for defense, you don't have much depth in terms of physical depth to withstand a Soviet attack. And because of how NATO forces were organized in their garrisons there also wasn't much in terms of force depth as well which also includes um which is also compounded by the fact that the americans and the british have reserve forces that they want to bring to germany in case of war but they would have to ship it through through merchant shipping to the north sea ports in order to get them into um, in Germany, which takes a few days in an yeah. emergency war situation. So basically, they so, had no depth. So if any any Soviet attack was successfully breaking through, they could immediately go in to exploit everything. Yes, um, that was the big that was the big fear and a big concern in the 1980s that poor defense would not actually work, and combined with a prospect of a Soviet surprise attack, not even work work at all. And um, during the 1980s, there were actually two plan, two um, schemes to to um, restore vi- viability for defense while still uh, adopting the same principle of um, defending to the border of um, East Germany. I won't go into much detail about this as in comparison to the Soviet plans. Maybe we can do that for another podcast another time. But the first plan was uh called was uh th- was uh, proposed by the commander of the British forces in Germany, uh, General Nigel Bagno, in 1984. He he was well aware that forward defense was not going to work in in practice, and he adopted what was called a counterstroke scheme, which was that instead of ha- pushing everything to defend at the front, the command uh, as as commander of the NATO ground forces in north in North Germany, he would uh he would adopt a scheme in which he would have a number of divisions into 
uh, not committed to battle as like a counter attack kind of force. And um, this was uh, adopted in some to a to an extent in in 1987 in the reporter exercises uh, certain strike. And um, that was that's one one uh, method in in northern Germany. The other method was called follow on forces attack, which was uh, proposed by by General Bernard Rogers, an American general, and he was a commander of uh, supreme commander of the NATO of uh, Allied forces from I think 1980, 1984 to 1987, which was that. Because the Soviets had lots of follow-on forces that would exploit in case of a breakthrough, um, NATO would um, uh, indirect fires and tactical aircraft to attack, to interdict, to systematically interdict and attack those uh, follow-on forces before they could commit to battle. But the problem with follow-on forces attack was that it used it was uh, relying on a lot of uh, next-generation weapons and sensors that were still in development during the 1980s. One example I would give it was um, was the J Stars radar system, which was um, put into service during the Gulf War in 1991, but um, was planned for went to service in the late in the late 1990s, I believe. And another another example of a weapon would be uh, would be a self. Yeah, there was a the Americans who were developing a. a a self-guided submunition that would attack, um, that would uh, top attack tanks, and it would be carried by artillery. It was called uh, Sad Arm. It was yeah, Sad Arm. Yeah, Sense and Destroy Armor is just the submunition. Basically, it's a. It was proposed as a means to reliably uh, destroy enemy tanks with uh, indirect fires. Of course, yeah, because tank have the weakest armor at the top, so with sub munitions, it it can work out with if it's yeah. quite a large amount of error, yeah. Yeah, that was the, yeah, that was the, like a final phase of a follow on forces attack. You would uh, rely on your conventional ground forces to withstand and defeat the main the forward the forward Soviet forces while you systematically attack. The Soviet follow-on forces with um, advanced weapons guided by advanced uh, advanced uh, sensors and and fire direction equipment. Thank you very much, Tech Arrow, for this valuable insight. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here on my first podcast. And hopefully we can do a follow-up podcast. And people, if you have questions, please note them in the comment section. And Thank you for listening and hear you next time. Bye. See you.